Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Xander's Facts. Welcome in, everybody, to the latest edition of the Xander's Facts podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander. It is Wednesday, October 4th. Episode 119 is what we're rolling with on the podcast this week. Thank you all so much for listening. We got big facts to discuss this week because we haven't really done, at least I think, as long as I can remember, a podcast really just on politics recently. Just a good old-fashioned politics episode. And that's what we're doing this week because there's a... Listen, y'all. Tuesday, October 3rd, the day I'm recording this podcast, was a big politics day. That's not even the stuff that we're mostly going to be talking about. This week, we are focusing on something called Project 2025. Probably haven't heard of it, probably because the media really hasn't been talking about it, but I think once you listen to this podcast and realize what exactly is in this Project 2025, you're going to be flipping out, because it's kind of insane. I'll discuss more, I'll give you all the facts in just a second here on the podcast, but before I do... Just wanted to tell you all that to support the podcast, follow this podcast, download this episode, rate and review. Check us out on all the social medias, Twitter, threads, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at Xander's Facts. Spread the facts, tell all your friends about the podcast and the newsletter, Xander's Weekend Facts, which if you don't know is a recap of the week's top headlines. It comes out every Sunday morning. It is free. The link is in this episode's description. Go sign up. And also check out the Xander's Facts link tree, which has all the Xander's Facts links that you need. All the facts are there. It is also linked in this episode's description. This week, though, is our politics-centered podcast, which I'm excited about, y'all, because I love talking politics sometimes. You know, because it's been a while since we've dived deep into the inner workings of Washington, D.C. But that's what we're doing this week. We're talking politics, and as I said, there's a lot of things to cover. I mean, we've got former President Donnie Boy, Donald Trump, who's currently on trial, not for any of the four indictments that have already been handed down, though, but instead in a New York civil case that accuses him of fraud. We, I mean, we could also talk about the drama that was once again unfolding in the House of Representatives. Kevin McCarthy's job as Speaker, he's out, and he ain't running again. So there's going to be a new Speaker. We have no clue who it's going to be. I mean, we had that whole Voterama thing. There was 15 or so votes in January, and this chaos could top that. I mean, we might talk about those. We'll probably talk about those at some point later on in the podcast. But what I wanted to focus on this week was... This effort that's being made by conservatives in the U.S., members of the Republican Party, to basically reshape how the federal government operates when they get into power. It's something that they're calling Project 2025, and I think that when you actually dive into what it specifically entails, because on the surface, Project 2025 is like, okay, whatever, but when you actually look into what is actually in this project, it's kind of terrifying. That's why it's particularly frustrating that the news media isn't talking about this at all, and, you know, we're instead talking more about Commander, the the president's dog who was biting Secret Service agents. Godzilla gets cold cocked. And by the way, only Secret Service agents are being bit. No one else. Which to me is like, I mean, I guess, you know, the Secret Service agents, you know, operate differently. Like, they act differently and strange because that's their job from normal humans, so maybe that takes the dog off, or I I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. You can go to Fox News to talk about that. But this week, I want to take a look at exactly what Project 2025 features, what the fallout could be if pieces of this plan ever come to pass, and of course the likelihood of it becoming a reality, because this is one of those weeks on the podcast. I mean, I do this podcast every week, except for last week because we had a flashback, but basically why I do this podcast is to inform. Because when I started this pod, I mean, it was two and a half years ago I started this podcast. I was like, we need to get the facts out there on a wide range of issues. We just don't talk about politics, sports, entertainment, news, whatever. I mean, we've talked about a ton of different stuff on this podcast. But politics was really one of the big things, you know, that I wanted to talk about on this podcast because there's a lot of misinformation out there and facts are important. With this Project 2025 Even though the presidential election is over a year away, you know, we're in October of 2023, we still got a month and a year until the presidential election. This is, this is one of those things that I think you really need to 
know about that you need to be informed about before you make your decision because this is kind of really important and you probably don't even know what I'm talking about yet but I'm going to explain it to y'all here in just a second as we do our factual breakdown of this thing called Project 2025. Judge Xander. Which over the next 13 months is going to be extremely important. But basically what I wanted to start this breakdown by is recapping kind of how we got to this point in our American political system, because it isn't just this Project 2025 thing, right? It's what's going on in the House of Representatives right now, what's going on in our politics overall. But in essence, what Project 2025 is, is a plan formulated by several right-wing conservative groups led by the Heritage Foundation. We've talked about them before on this podcast to lead the next Republican president through the first 180 days in office. And they think that they're going to get a Republican elected in 2024, which is why it's called Project 2025. And the New York Times described this plan in an article from July, the title of that article, Trump and allies forge plans to increase presidential power in 2025. That article began with the quote, Donald J. Trump and his allies are planning a sweeping expansion of presidential power over the machinery of government if voters return him to the White House in 2025, reshaping the structure of the executive branch to concentrate far greater authority directly in his hands, unquote. So this 900-page plan is ultimately part of a plan Project 2025 is only part of what was just described in that New York Times piece. It's part of a plan to put more power in the hands of the executive branch, specifically the president, in order to, I mean, to put it plainly, to implement an authoritarian agenda. But this isn't some kind of, you know, wild mishmash of policies that are suddenly been thrown together. I mean, this is the culmination of decades of work from these groups, specifically here the Heritage Foundation. I mean, Project 2025 is actually just the latest in a series of publications that are titled Mandate for Leadership. Now, the first Mandate for Leadership was published back in January 1981, not so coincidentally, in fact, specifically because it was the same time that Ronald Reagan was inaugurated for his first term as president. Now, that first edition, all 3,000 pages of it, called for many policy suggestions, such as income tax cuts, the presidential line item veto, inner-city enterprise zones, increased defense spending, halting Justice Department affirmative action policies, and many more. And the Reagan White House loved it, and they worked over the next year to implement nearly 60% of the 2,000 policy suggestions that were in that first edition of Mandate for Leadership that came from the Heritage Foundation, and they have since published eight additional editions of the Mandate for Leadership. Each of them have been released right around or after the election of a Republican for president, most of them. In 1984, for Reagan's second term, 88, George H.W. Bush's sole term. Before the 1996 presidential election, Bill Clinton still won that election. After George W. Bush's first election victory in 2000, in 2005 for his second term, in 2016, after the election of Trump, and then in 2020, just before the presidential election that Trump lost. And basically, it's been the same. Not the policy suggestions, but the what the mandate for leadership is. It's a list of policy suggestions, basically, for a conservative Republican to implement, because if you can remember from the 1980s, the Heritage Foundation was deeply influential in what Reagan and the elder Bush passed during their presidencies, or what they advocated for. And so now we have a new edition of this Mandate for Leadership book, series, document, whatever you want to call it. But it's unique, not just for the fact that unlike most of its predecessors, it is coming out well before the presidential election. We're talking about well over a year because I believe it came out a couple of months ago in 2023. So well over a year before the presidential election, which is unprecedented for these Mandate for Leadership releases. But it also feels like a culmination of the modern conservative movement that the Heritage Foundation really helped jumpstart 40 years ago with the election of Ronald Reagan. 
And that word culmination is what I'm going to come back to because it's a really big one, I think, for this podcast. But you could say that this goes back even further, back to the civil rights era of the 1950s and the 1960s. Because if you take a look at the history of this country and the political system in this country, it's really always has been a two-party system. And since really right before the Civil War, when Abraham Lincoln became the first Republican elected president, it's been the two-party system between the Democrats and the Republicans. But where they've stood ideologically, what they've stood for, has drastically changed since the Democrats and the Republicans emerged as the main two parties in the U.S. And the 1950s and the 1960s, the civil rights era, really helped define the ideological makeup of the two major political parties in this country. And I bring that up because it's been interesting to hear one of the Republican presidential candidates, Donnie Boy isn't the only one just running, even though he's not in the debates. They've had debates. Donnie Boy's not there. It's kind of like the uh, undercard, I guess you could say that. But South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, he's running for president. He actually said on the debate stage last week that the Great Society that was passed and implemented by the Lyndon B. Johnson administration was actually harder to survive for African Americans than slavery. Take a listen. Here's the challenge, though. Black families survived slavery. We survived poll taxes and literacy tests. We survived discrimination being woven into the laws of our country. What was hard to survive was Johnson's Great Society, where they decided to put money, where they decided to take the black father out of the household to get a check in the mail, and you can now measure that in unemployment, in crime, in devastation. So just take that in for a moment. Tim Scott is black, if you didn't know. A black man saying that programs designed to give money to African-American families who were systematically oppressed for generations in this country is worse than slavery. And you all heard, too. He got, he got applause for that, too. Let's just see, though, what was included in the Great Society, which was a series of domestic programs that was passed by Congress and was signed by Lyndon B. Johnson in 1964 and 1965. Now, a lot of these programs were actually holdovers from the John F. Kennedy administration that hadn't gotten passed yet, you know, because Kennedy did not continue to live. History.com claims the Great Society is the largest social reform plan in modern American history. So if you didn't know exactly what the Great Society entails... Here comes a fact! Basically, the goals of these programs were ultimately to eliminate poverty and racial injustice by declaring a war on poverty, which consisted of creating a job corps of 100,000 disadvantaged men who would work on conservation projects and receive education and job skills training. I think that's what Scott is talking about in this clip. But it, it, I, I struggle to understand the government giving you education, giving you job training, giving you work, so you can grow generational wealth. That was worse than slavery. Y'all, that is why Tim Scott is not a serious human being. The Great Society also had the National Work Study Program, offering 140,000 Americans the opportunity to go to college who couldn't otherwise afford it. Oh my gosh, the horror. But what you also have are the passage of two extremely popular programs today, Medicare and Medicaid, that provide health care for the elderly, as well as those getting assistance from the government. You also have the creation of of the Head Start program, which has since served over 32 million vulnerable children in the U.S., and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act gave funding to school districts where the student population came from low-income households. You've got the Water Quality Act, which was passed in 1965 to control water pollution, along with the Motor Vehicle Air Pollution Control Act, which has led to the emissions standards on vehicles we have today. I mean, there's A ton of other policies that came into effect, but that's the gist. Too many facts. Like the Great Society wasn't some burden for people, especially when at this time, you know, I go off into that little tangent because it's important to remember that this point 
of history, the 1950s, the 1960s. You know, it's important to remember what the modern conservative movement actually originates from. How did conservatism in the United States devolve into where we are today? It's not exactly, you know, a true starting point because we've had some sort of conservatism that's always existed in some form in American politics. But this, the 50s and the 60s, seems like a nice starting point for the modern era, at least, because as I said, this was really the point in time where the current makeup of the Liberal Democratic Party and the Conservative Republican Party starts to come together. Because if you remember, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln and the North, a lot of them were Republicans. And Robert E. Lee, Andrew Jackson, the South was mostly comprised of Democrats. You know, a lot of states that are in the former Confederacy that have not voted for a Democrat, for president at least, in several decades, because the 50s and the 60s is where this really started, and it's kind of evolved over the last several decades. Like, you know, West Virginia was a one of the largest Democratic strongholds in the country, and now it is the polar opposite. And that just happened over the last couple of decades. Like, if you told somebody in the 1980s, you know, in the 1980 presidential election, West Virginia was one of the few states that voted for Jimmy Carter instead of Ronald Reagan. If you told somebody in the 1980s, West Virginia is a, one of the most Republican states in the country, I mean, they wouldn't have believed you. But that's how our politics has changed. And what was the starting point? Really, it had a lot to do with the civil rights policy and things that were passed in the Great Society. You had Southern Democrats like Strom Thurmond leave the party because Lyndon B. Johnson led the effort to pass the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which was bipartisan. Both parties voted for it, but there were Democrats who did not vote for it and then subsequently left the party and joined the Republicans. Thurmond joined the Republican Party along with others. And then he, along with 1964 Republican presidential nominee Barry Goldwater and the, later a Republican president, Richard Nixon, that set the stage for the Southern strategy, which was implemented by Republicans, where Republicans basically took advantage of many white people in the South who were not happy that segregation had ended and that Jim Crow era laws were being phased out to promote, oh my gosh, standard rights for minorities. How terrible. You have to use the same water fountain as me? But you go back to the 1960s, and that's what all the hubbub was about in the South. And so what that did, getting Southern Democrats like Strom Thurmond to join the party, and then the Republican Party basically coalescing around the Southern strategy, was push the party to the right, ideologically, which set up their current conservative makeup. So back to what Tim Scott said, making sure people get an education and training to enter the workforce was worse than slavery. The gaslighting is absolutely insane, y'all. But it shows you really what the underbelly of the Republican Party is and has been for decades. Because the modern form of the Republican Party, where they control the southern U.S. and a bunch of other states too, but when you talk about control of the South in the U.S., it took decades, but states like Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Texas, are mostly controlled by Republicans. And you're starting to see the shift in states like Georgia, too, back to the Democrats after there was this decades-long shift from the Democrats basically controlling everything in the South to it completely flipping. And why was that? There's lots of reasons. But the civil rights movement and the passage of civil rights laws and welfare programs that were mostly led by Democrats in the 1960s really led to this movement happening. And so then, that's kind of the basis point. In 1973, we entered the Heritage Foundation, which was founded then, but it really didn't gain popularity until it came out with the first mandate for freedom and the Reagan presidency. But how? Did this come about? Because you had some Republicans, specifically members of the Richard Nixon administration, because you remember Richard Nixon actually did some very liberal things like create the Environmental Protection Agency, 
Richard Nixon as president wasn't this wholly unabashed conservative. And so you have disgruntled members of his administration who formed the Heritage Foundation because they say the party has not gone far enough to the right. We need to go, we need to be more conservative. And so ultimately, that's what Ronald Reagan seized on. I mean, it was pretty easy for a Republican to win the 1980 election. The country wasn't doing so well economically. And that's a lot of what matters in a presidential election, for better or worse, when there's not other massive extenuating circumstances. But I don't need to remind you about some of the policies implemented by Ronald Reagan while he was president. I mean, we talked about that on a past episode of this podcast, episode 36. Here we go. If y'all want to go listen back to that. But I'm not, you know, it's not just about race relations and welfare programs. You know, Reagan's, his famous welfare queen story has repeatedly been debunked as false. But also implementing trickle-down economics, cutting the top-end tax rate from 70% during his presidency to 28% which has obviously led to the wealth gap we have today going crazy. And we've talked about before on this podcast, cutting AIDS research in the 1980s, taking money from Social Security to increase government spending when he talked about government is the problem, we're going to decrease government spending, but he actually increased government spending. And then he cut taxes, which, you know, those two things don't go together. He tripled the national debt, and that's just domestic policy. Listen, that's not what we're talking about this week. But that same group, the Heritage Foundation, which promoted the rise of Ronald Reagan, also promoted the rise of Newt Gingrich and the GOP during the Clinton presidency in the 1990s, along with the Tea Party Republicans in 2010. And, you know, when they were founded, the Heritage Foundation, they really tried to differentiate themselves from another conservative think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, because What the Heritage Foundation said is we're also going to advocate for the religious right or the Christian right. And you can see how much of an influence they have had on politics in the Republican Party over the last couple of decades. So this group, the Heritage Foundation, has developed their latest plan, which is, I mean, I think much worse for American democracy than anything they've done in the past. You know, really with Ronald Reagan, it's a lot of... What I just mentioned, the tax cuts, the spending, talk about how you don't like welfare programs, like all that stuff really, you know, not directly hurts democracy, but it's kind of evolved since that first edition of the Mandate for Freedom to what we have now. What do we have now? It's Project 2025. Now that we've gone through that little history lesson, let's take a look at exactly what is in Project 2025, and why I think we should all be concerned. Because first, I think it's important to note that really, unlike the 2020 Republican Party platform that they put out, which was basically whatever Donald Trump wants, this actually isn't all dependent on Donnie Boy winning the election next year. The writers of this plan have been very careful to note that it is for any Republican who wins the 2024 election. And you've already got candidates like Ron DeSantis, Ron McDonald, and Vivek Ramaswamy, who have even endorsed some of their proposals already. Of course, you know, who are we kidding? It's October 2023, but unless he drops dead, it's a one-man race to the Republican primary, y'all. But let's just take a look at how those who created Project 2025, the 2025 Presidential Transition Project, define the plan. Now, this is from the front page of their website. They say, quote, It is not enough for conservatives to win elections if we are going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left. We need both a governing agenda and the right people in place ready to carry this agenda out on day one of the next conservative administration. This is the goal of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project. The project will build on four pillars that will collectively pave the way for an effective conservative administration. Those four pillars are policy agenda, personal database, training, and a 180-day playbook. But the big thing here is the policy agenda. What do they want a Republican president to implement in their first 180 days in office? Because remember, Ronald Reagan implemented over 60% of what the Heritage Foundation suggested. This isn't some far off you know, loony, these people are nobodies plan. This is from the people 
who were at the center of power in the Republican Party. So, what is in that policy agenda? Let's get down into the nitty gritties, because it really all comes down to reinstating something that is known as Schedule F. Schedule F was established through a Trump executive order back in October of 2020 that created this new employment category for federal employees. Now, federal government employees, basically civil servants, most of them who serve in roles that the president cannot remove, the president does not have the power to remove them, who were assigned under Schedule F, would then become at-will employees, which would make them a lot easier to fire, to get rid of. When President Biden took office, he immediately rescinded that order, but Trump has vowed to reinstate that order if he retakes office, and all it would take is another executive order. That would mean potentially 50,000 federal workers, maybe more, would be fired, and they wouldn't just be, their jobs would be gone, they would be replaced by appointees, individuals who would be more loyal to the current administration. So right now, you know, you've got about 4,000 federal employees out of the over 2 million who comprise the federal workforce. Only about 4,000 are political appointees and usually change with each administration. And so, you know, you look at it at the surface, it may not sound so bad. And even some conservatives, you know, argue on that point that a president should be surrounded by those who will implement ter- their policies. But what this brings with it is a major concern because you need these experienced civil servants in these positions who can implement laws without fear of political repercussions. You need people who can say no to you as president when you do something that goes against the law of the United States. Now, that's probably something Trump would admit that he screwed up when he first became president, is that he put too many people around him who told him no. No! And then we kind of saw the shift during his presidency, during those four years where ultimately by the end of his term, you could clearly tell his ideas were getting crazier and crazier. I mean, we went from nuking a hurricane to inciting an insurrection. The civil servants are there to make sure he doesn't nuke a hurricane. Yes, because I... I don't know. But these employees, you know, they make sure the government runs effectively. You're talking about making sure recipients get their food stamps, national parks stay open. Everything the government does is up to these civil servants, the people you have no clue who they are. But they're extremely important in making sure the government runs. And these positions are critical. And when you have them replaced by political operatives, basically, that's what conservatives want. Because they would make the government ineffective, which is ultimately, and it's a little early to get to the point of all this, but it really is the point to try and make you think that when the Republicans come into power, they say government's not working, so let's get rid of it, or parts of it, and then you agree with them, but the ones who made it not work were those same people. And so that's what they're trying to do right here. And then with this, that's where the training pillar comes in, which is extremely strange because the Heritage Foundation is going beyond just giving policy suggestions. And according to Politico, they are recruiting, quote, conservative warriors, unquote, from bar associations and state attorneys general offices across the country and installing them throughout the federal government. That's what their plan is, because Paul Danz is the director of the project who worked in the Trump administration. He told the Associated Press, quote, we need to flood the zone with conservatives, unquote. He goes on, quote, this is a clarion call to come to Washington. People need to lay down their tools and step aside from their professional life and say, this is my lifetime moment to serve, unquote, which, what? I need to st- lay down my tools and come to Washington to serve. Here's how the AP goes on to describe this effort in that same article. Quote, The unprecedented effort is being orchestrated with dozens of right-flank organizations, many new to Washington, and represents a changed approach from conservatives who traditionally have sought to limit the federal government by cutting federal taxes and slashing federal spending. Instead, Trump-era conservatives want to gut 
the administrative state from within by ousting federal employees they believe are standing in the way of the president's agenda and replacing them with like-minded officials more eager to fulfill a new executive's approach to governing. The goal is to avoid the pitfalls of Trump's first years in office when the Republican president's team was ill-prepared, his cabinet nominees had trouble winning Senate confirmation, and policies were met with resistance by lawmakers, government workers, and even Trump's own appointees who refused to bend or break protocol or in some cases violate laws to achieve his goals. Unquote. So what that's kind of reminiscent of is a past era of American governance, the spoil system. If you can remember from high school U.S. history class, the spoil system was used from the founding of the country until the Pendleton Act was passed in 1883. Now, the spoil system basically functioned as when a president was elected, he would give government jobs in the bureaucracy to his supporters, his friends, his relatives. And in 1883, this was replaced by a merit system because we figured out that the spoil system was pretty corrupt. This is true. But what sounds like from this is that the Trump administration would go back to this. And the thing is, they're not being sneaky about it either. It's wide out in the open what they're basically saying they want to do. I mean, the last sentence of that article that I just read, lawmakers, government workers, and even Trump's own appointees who refuse to bend or break protocol, or in some cases violate laws to achieve his goals. So what Trump wants is for his workers to violate laws in order to achieve his goals. That's what they basically are saying. They want avoid the pitfalls of Trump's first years in office. And they also use this term administrative state, which I don't think a lot of them know about, but that's a term that people like Steve Bannon like to use a lot. And when they use that term, they're really talking about the growth of the government that really started under this merit system, first under really President Woodrow Wilson back in the early 1900s, and then, of course, you know, expanded with the New Deal under FDR and the Great Society. And it's used in this Politico quote from Russell Vogt, who was the director of the Office of Management and Budget under the Trump administration and is in charge of implementing the policy program for Project 2025. He says, quote, we think it's more systematic than it is just about Trump. We have political prisoners in this country for the first time I can remember, Fout says referring in part to those convicted for their roles in the January 6th assault on the Capitol. We have people that are in jail, that are no threat to their community and no flight risk, that are being mistreated in jail. The court system has adopted a paradigm that they are a threat to democracy. As a result, Vogt says, we have to be thinking mechanically about how to take these institutions over. Vout is reassembling his old team at the Trump Office of Management and Budget and describes his role as drafting fresh executive orders, playbooks, and memoranda for cabinet secretaries to be ready on day one of the next transition, whatever is necessary, to seize control of the administrative state is really our task, unquote. So that's who's leading this charge. People who think that those who have gone to jail over breaking into the Capitol on January 6, 2021, are political prisoners. Uh-oh. When the Heritage Foundation sends its people, y'all, they're not sending their best. Actually, Vout is the head of a different group, the Center for Renewing America. Oh, I wonder what that means which is one of 75 conservative groups that have actually signed on to Project 2025. Heritage Foundation is usually the one who creates these and writes these and publishes these and all these, but there's a lot of conservative groups, a lot of small ones, who have signed on to this project as well. And so that's really one main, but probably the biggest threat, I would say, is what they call the administrative state, and they want to seize control. But there's a lot of other stuff here in this, uh, in this plan. Let's see. Let's, uh, energy and the environment. Because Project 2025 actually calls for the elimination of three agencies within the Department of Energy. The Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, the Office of State and Community Energy Programs, and the Office of Grid Deployment. So, obviously, all three of those offices have a major role 
in the transition currently ongoing between fossil fuels and clean, renewable energy sources. So what does Project 2025 want to do? Well, here's a quote from the plan itself. Quote, support repeal of massive spending bills like the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, which establish new programs and are providing hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies to renewable energy developers, their investors, and special interests, and support the rescinding of all funds not already spent by these programs. Also, unleash private sector energy innovation by ending government interference in energy decisions, and also stop the war on oil and natural gas, unquote. But wait a second. Well, first off, before I even get to what I was just about to say, the war on oil and natural gas. Do y'all know the number of how many barrels of oil that this country is producing a day right now, or at least in July of this year, the U.S. field production of crude oil, according to the Energy Information Administration, was 12,991,000 barrels per day. That's 12 million, almost 13, basically 13 million barrels of oil that this country is producing a day, which is as high as that number has ever been. So the war on oil and natural gas is kind of BS. But also, why would they want to stop the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy sources like hydro, wind, solar, you know, we've talked about on this podcast. I mean, to answer that question, we can just take a look at some of the organizations that actually fund the Heritage Foundation. And oh, who did I find when I looked that information up? Well, that would be none other than the Kochs. The Koch brothers, one of whom who died in 2019, but the Koch family, not the Biden crime family, the Koch family, who have led Coke Industries, which makes more than half of its money from fossil fuels because it owns refineries, petrochemical plants, and thousands of miles of oil and gas pipelines. It all makes sense now, doesn't it? If you say so. Why would we want to go back to further relying on oil, natural gas, coal, all that stuff? Why would we want to stop the transition to renewable energy? Oh, well, because it's not in the Koch brothers' financial interests. That's why. That's basically what this project says right there. But that's not all that's in here. We've got the Justice Department. Straight from the source, quote, While it is true, as it is with other federal departments and agencies, that there are committed career personnel across the department who perform their duties faithfully with the best intentions, this small sampling of scandals illustrates that the DOJ has become a bloated bureaucracy with a critical core of personnel who are infatuated with the perpetuation of a radical liberal agenda and the defeat of perceived political enemies. It has become a cabinet-level department whose leadership appears to care more about how they are perceived in the next Politico or Washington Post article or their stature with any number of radical leftist organizations than they do about justice and advancing the interests of the American people. It is essential that the next conservative administration place a high priority on reforming the DOJ and its culture to align the department with its core purposes and advance the national interests. Critically, this must include the FBI. Anything other than a top-to-bottom overhaul will only further erode the trust of significant portions of the American people and harm the very fabric that holds together our constitutional republic. At a practical level, Not reforming the Department of Justice will also guarantee the failure of that conservative administration's agenda in countless other ways, unquote. So what should be done? In not-so-subtle terms, Project 2025 believes that the independence that currently exists between the Department of Justice and the president should no longer exist. That's something that Trump has repeatedly wished for on the campaign trail so that he can investigate his political opponents. Of course. That's something that Republicans are criticizing President Biden for doing right now, which he isn't. And if he was, he probably wouldn't have let the Department of Justice appoint a special counsel and then prosecute his son, Hunter. Like, 
if he was actually infiltrating himself into the Department of Justice, I don't think that would have happened, but it did. So, uh, either way, I don't think I need to go more in depth on why getting rid of the independence between the president and the Department of Justice is a bad idea, because it continues the erosion, not just of the checks and balances our government's supposed to be based on, but also the integrity of the government that Republicans appear so poised as to remove, even though they say, oh my gosh, they're eroding the trust of significant portions of the American people and harming the very fabric that holds together a constitutional republic, when what they are proposing, getting rid of the independence between the president and the Justice Department, that erodes the fabric that holds together a constitutional republic. Not what's been, what they say, is going on. The weaponization of the Department of Justice, which you hear about if you watch Sean Hannity's show, because I feel like he only talks about that nowadays. But either way, I mean, prohibiting the FBI from combating the dissemination of misinformation, which is also what they want to do in this, would also fall into that category. And we can also talk about abortion, because y'all know the conservative tirade has not stopped at the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Republicans who, you know, once claimed to be the party of small government and little government interference, are calling to reverse the approval of chemical abortion drugs, along with intensifying the prosecution of individuals who provide or distribute abortion pills by mail. Because as the plan notes, quote, allowing mail order abortions is a gift to the abortion industry, unquote. Project 2025 would also quote, reverse policies that allow transgender individuals to serve in the military, unquote, along with prohibiting travel funding for abortions. Because you know what they say, oh, well, your abortion's legal in Illinois, so just, if you live in Indiana, just go to Illinois. But they don't want that either. I, okay. They said it was a state's issue, and now they're trying to prohibit, okay. Moving on to, though, this is the big one, the woke issues, because we know woke is a major problem in this country right now. From pages four and five of the plan, quote, the next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. How about that? This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender identity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, gender gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitive, abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, regulation, and piece of legislation that exists, unquote. So, abortion is violating your you get an abortion, you're violating your First Amendment rights, apparently. How about that? I honestly have no clue what they mean by depriving Americans of First Amendment rights by using those terms. Like, I don't know. So that would mean that the Pentagon would have to get rid of their DEI efforts, diversity, equity, and inclusion, to promote the horror. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. How could they? Oh my gosh. But also included in the plan is to reinstate service members who were discharged because they refused to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Oh my gosh, wonderful. Let's get those people back in the military. And just in case you're wondering, they, I counted, the Project 2025 document features the word woke 33 times in total, y'all. That also does include, though, a couple of instances of wokeism, wokeness, and the Great Awakening, all of which my computer told me were not words. So I'm sure the authors of this document had a wonderful time with spell check when they tried to write the Great Awakening. But here's one of those instances from page four. Quote, today the left is threatening the tax exempt status of churches and charities that reject woke progressivism. They will soon turn to Christian schools and clubs with the same totalitarian intent, unquote. But here's the thing with that. Like, if you're a religious organization that is exempt from paying taxes, but then you wage your way into politics and you advocate for 
certain political policies or parties, or you even endorse candidates, why should you maintain your tax exempt status? Like that to me doesn't make sense. But apparently, I'm a part of the Great Awakening, so I don't. What do I know? Jeez. But another portion of this whole plan, I guess, Project 2025, that I found I interesting, I guess is a word I could say, was the section on the Department of Health and Human Services. Now here, the plan lays out the following. Quote, protect faith-based grant recipients from religious liberty violations and maintain a biblically-based social science reinforced definition of marriage and family, unquote. So what does that mean? What does that jumble of words mean? Oh, you know, something, something, probably ban gay marriage. Like, you can probably tell from my explanations, but also if you read the document, that it is extremely deliberately worded, as in, it doesn't explicitly say ban gay marriage, because, you know, 70% of the American public supports gay marriage now. But you kind of get the gist when you read the thing, that when they talk about a biblically-based definition of marriage and family, oh, I know what they mean. And this phenomenon really pops up in many other instances of the plan as well. But ultimately, what this lines up to, and there are still many other policy proposals I didn't even outline that you can still find in a bunch of news articles outlining it and in the document itself, is how that New York Times quote I read earlier describes this. Donald J. Trump and his allies are planning a sweeping expansion of power, presidential power, over the machinery of government if voters return him to the White House in 2025, reshaping the structure of the executive branch to concentrate far greater authority directly in his hands. But the article continues, quote, Mr. Trump and his associates have a broader goal to alter the balance of power by increasing the president's authority over every part of the federal government that now operates by either law or tradition with any measure of independence from political interference by the White House. Mr. Trump intends to bring independent agencies like the Federal Communications Commission, which makes and enforces rules for television and internet companies and the Federal Trade Commission, which enforces various antitrust and other consumer protection rules against businesses under direct presidential control. He wants to revive the practice of impounding funds refusing to spend money Congress has appropriated for programs a president doesn't like, which is a tactic that was banned by lawmakers under President Richard Nixon. He intends to strip employment protections from tens of thousands of career civil servants, making it easier to replace them if they are deemed obstacles to his agenda. And he plans to scour the intelligence agencies, the State Department, and the defense bureaucracies to remove officials he has vilified as the sick political class that hates our country, unquote. So here's what it is, y'all. It is a blatant attempt, a blatant effort, to shore up support for an authoritarian leader. It's not a reach to say, these policies, they're pretty authoritarian. They're pretty dictatorial. Nowhere in the actual document does it use the words overthrow or coup or the phrase getting rid of elections but that's essentially what this is it's making sure the entire executive branch is under the eye of one man who can remove anyone he wants when he doesn't get his way like y'all know why trump did not succeed in his illegal efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election which he lost he failed because there were civil servants all across the government who made sure he didn't get his way. Not because they maybe didn't like him or had a grudge against them, but because it was against the law and the integral foundations of American democracy. If these plans were implemented, that goes bye-bye. And the result is an authoritarian leader who can gladly do whatever he wants because the checks and balances meant to keep the executive from blatantly flaunting their power are gone. This is really the plan that seeks to make sure Republicans never lose another election as long as the United States continues to stand. Because we have efforts like these that make the prospect that our democracy 
is going to continue for much longer, a pipe dream. We're going to become like Russia, which Donnie Boy truly does seem to admire, by the way, by having elections in quotes, in name only. Like, we'll have elections, but we already know the winner. You know, that's what this would ultimately entail. That is why it is an extremely scary prospect, not just that this idea is being thrown out there, but that it's in writing, and it was developed by many right-wing policy advocates and specialists who are funded by many well-known conservative groups like the Heritage Foundation. It's all true! And of course, you all know why they need to do this, because they've chosen this path instead of the other path they could reasonably take to, you know, sustain their relevance as a political party in the United States and moderate their policies. Because y'all know, I've said this a million times on this podcast, I always say it, that there have been eight presidential elections since 1992. In the last 31 years, 30 so years, we've had eight presidential elections in this country, and the Republicans have won the most votes. They've gotten the most actual votes. I'm not talking about electoral college. I'm talking about the popular vote. They've won the popular vote in just one of those, and that was in 2004. So that's why they're doing this, y'all, because they don't want to moderate their policies, and so they've decided to take the authoritarian route, which is obviously the one we, I would rather have not them chosen for the sake of our democracy. But I'm not done with all this, y'all, because it just so happens that many of these things in Project 2025 also line up with Trump's very own Agenda 47, because if he gets reelected, he'd be the 47th president. Because, you know, as I said, they've carefully crafted the text in Project 2025 to not explicitly say it must be Trump. Just any Republican, of course, you know, let's be real, that man's going to win the Republican nomination. But Trump's own plan for a second term is just as wild and terrifying as what has been laid out by outside groups for him. And Trump's talked about many of these things out in the open, on the campaign trail, and on the true social platform that he's got, that he does whatever on there. But among the list of outrageous positions he's taken, even beyond what's in Project 2025, most of which he's agreed to and says he would do, includes requiring police departments to engage in the policy known as stop and frisk, which is a police tactic to detain and search people who police may have believe have weapons or contraband items on their persons, even though it was ruled unconstitutional by a federal judge in New York back in 2013. Now, this was a major hot topic in Donnie Boy City, New York City, when it was implemented back in 2002 under then-Mayor Rudy Giuliani. But the stop-and-frisk policy was shown to target minorities. It had no beneficial impact on reducing crime and actually impacted property values in the city. It lessened some property values in the city where stop-and-frisk was more prevalent. So it was ultimately... A net negative. That's a fact! Now, Trump has also brought up the economic trade policy of tariffs. He says he wants to increase tariffs on countries like China, which he already implemented some during his presidency. Those backfired, though, then they've been found to have a negative effect on the country's economy because there was a study from two years ago from the U.S. China Business Council that found that Trump's trade policies actually cost the country a quarter of a million jobs, and people prefer him for the economy, which makes no sense. Trump has proposed also that the death penalty be brought for drug dealers, smugglers, and traffickers. Of course, it's repeatedly been found that the death penalty is not just more expensive, it is far more expensive for the government than just keeping somebody in prison for life without parole. Like, it may not seem that way, you would think that doesn't make sense, but actually look up the numbers, and it's actually not close. And it's also more inhumane. I don't think Donnie Boy cares about that, though. And, you know, just in case someone is found guilty wrongly, which has happened in the past, decades later, we've realized people shouldn't have been found guilty. Death penalty, 
you can't reverse that. Trump has also called to end birthright citizenship, which allows those born in the U.S. to citizens of foreign countries. You know, if your parents are citizens not of the U.S., but if you're born in the U.S., you're a citizen. But that likely goes against the 14th Amendment, what Trump wants to do, end it, because 14th Amendment states all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So that is likely unconstitutional. It's also interesting, though, how there's another Republican candidate, Vivek Ramaswamy, who I mentioned earlier. He wants to end birthright citizenship, too, even though he's a product of birthright citizenship. He was born in this country to parents who were not citizens of this country and became a citizen because he was born here. I mean, the classic rules for thee, not for me. Yikes! And as you probably know, Trump has also promised to issue pardons and even government apologies to those who have been charged for their involvements in the insurrection on January 6th, 2021. How wonderful. But what Trump also wants to do is deploy the military, no transgenders in the military, but deploy the military to fight street crime, break up gangs, and deport immigrants, while also creating these, what he calls, freedom cities on federal land, which he says will include flying cars. Which I don't know yet. We can't even have self-driving cars yet. We Flying cars is a long way off. Oh, and he also wants to cut funding for schools that teach critical race theory. But hey, you know, just the typical stuff. Oh man, y'all, we have talked a lot about critical race theory on this podcast, let me tell you. So, all those policies, I guess you could say, really don't fly in the face of democracy. Like, I don't agree with a single one of them, but really not on democratic principles. Maybe that 14th Amendment one, that was kind of a joke. But Trump's approvals and admiration of that proposal to not only investigate his political rivals, but also jail and execute them, kind of is. And that, of course, comes from the fact that he wants to personally oversee the Department of Justice. He wants to get rid of that independence, which, yeah, that flies in the face of democracy. And I did say execute, because here's what he said on Truth Social about recently retired Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley, who served under both Biden and Trump. Donnie Boy said, quote, Mark Milley, who led perhaps the most embarrassing moment in American history with his grossly incompetent implementation of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, costing many lives, leaving behind hundreds of American citizens and handing over billions of dollars of the finest military equipment ever made, will be leaving the military next week. This will be a time for all citizens of the USA to celebrate. This guy turned out to be a woke train wreck who, if the fake news reporting is correct, was actually dealing with China to give them a heads up on the thinking of the President of the United States. This is an act so egregious that in times gone by, the punishment would have been DEATH. In all caps. A war between China and the United States could have been the result of the treasonous act to be continued with three exclamation points to end, unquote. So, first off, most embarrassing moment in American history. There has been a bunch of those. I don't think the Afghanistan withdrawal ranks up there. But also, let me note, on that withdrawal from Afghanistan, we had to do that because guess who, in the final weeks before he left office, signed a withdrawal agreement with the Taliban. That would be Donny Boy himself. Why isn't that mentioned in the blame? Probably because a lot of people don't know about it. But it, it's true, y'all. There are, listen, there are many reasons why the man is unfit to serve in an office in the government of the United States. But that has to be up there. It's true. He, listen, from that message and all the other true social messages we've talked about on this podcast before, no mentally stable man would send out those messages and say, yes, this is good. I don't think so. You also might want to listen to what he had to say the other day about sharks at a campaign rally. Take a listen. But if I'm sitting down and that boat's going down and I'm on top of a battery and the water starts flooding in, I'm getting concerned. 
But then I look 10 yards to my left and there's a shark over there. So I have a choice of electrocution or shark. You know what I'm going to take? Electrocution. I will take electrocution every single time. Do we agree? I will take electrocution. Electrocution. I don't know, y'all. I don't know where he got... Like, I don't know how he comes up with these things at his campaign rallies. It's just... Oh, boy. But in another speech, this is more relevant. At the Conservative Political Action Conference back in the summer, he said, quote, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution, unquote. First off, he is not a warrior to anybody. For those who truly believe and love him. Of course they ate it up though. Like you see, I guess I'm on Twitter all the time, but I see these images of like these people who love fawn over Trump. And they're like these drawings of him in the Superman costume with all the muscles. Like, why do they need to portray him like that? Because that's not what he's like in real life. He's a slob. Like an image of his face plastered over Jabba the Hutt would be more accurate to what he looks like. Like... I don't understand why they have to portray him like that, like in a fictitious light. But we have to remember that Donald Trump is not one of those people who truly believes everything he says. The man was a Democrat for many years, supporter and friends of the Clintons and the Obamas, until he found the perfect grifting opportunity. And y'all, he took it. Not too dissimilar from that of Ku Klux Clay Travis, Candace Owens, people who they want you to believe they're conservative, they're warriors fighting for you. They're, they're some of those conservative warriors. But actually, they started their career advocating for the other side. But then they found that the grift was on the other side because the other side has, you know, people who will just believe whatever you say. It doesn't have to be true. It was, you know, they'll eat it up. And they found that and they were like, oh, I'm going to go grift. So, you know, he'll say anything to get these people to go crazy for him. People who feel they have been wronged by the American government system, even if he doesn't believe a word of it. I mean, he couldn't give a rat's ass about those people, y'all. Even though they believe, they support him unequivocally, they want to hear everything he has to say. Which, y'all, is a term we call brainwashing. But that all brings me back to my little historical tirade earlier when I said that the foundation of the modern political parties comes from the civil rights era. There are many, many, many people in this country who believe some extremely abhorrent, untrue, racist, misogynist BS and blame others for their own wrongdoings. Like it especially seems to be those who receive assistance from the government. These thoughts have been around since the dawn of time, you all know. But the civil rights era brought a point where one political party was like, all right, we've had enough. We need to promote equality regardless of your gender, your race, whatever. But it's almost as though the emergence of Donald Trump, however many years, 60, 50, 60 years later, allowed these simmering fissures, all of which have basically coalesced around the Republican Party, to suddenly burst. Like, it obviously helped that Democrats elected, you know, a man who was half black as president, which made a lot of people's minds in this country explode. But when Trump came on the scene and he basically said the racist and other hateful things that these people have been thinking for years, it led them to believe, oh, well, it's okay to say these things out in the open. You know, and that's where we've gotten politically correct oh you're being too politically correct from what being racist or misogynist um yeah but that's ultimately why i used the word culmination earlier remember i came back to this whoa how this 2024 election is kind of like the culmination of the modern conservative movement that was begun by reagan and the heritage foundation 40 years ago it's almost like it's built up to Trump and his overtaking of the Republican Party, but also the culmination of what kind of a country we want to live in, because Republicans love to claim that Democrats are all about imposing tyrannical, 
Marxist, communist, socialist ideals, their socialist agenda on the American people. And then when you ask them, where have Democrats said that they're going to do this? They say you have to read between the lines because, y'all, it's not real. They just blurt that out. But now we don't have to read between the lines with the Republican Party because they are controlled, whether they like it or not, by an individual who promotes the absolute worst in human beings, who gets them to say the worst things to other humans, and who has shown he does not believe in the rule of law, or, I mean, if he did, he wouldn't have been indicted four times, or in democratic institutions that this country is founded on and what makes it great, ultimately. But now he has brought along many others on the right side of the aisle to implement his authoritarian ideals with him because they know that's the only way, without radically changing their policies, they can stay in power in this democratic system that we have, which is not, listen, the democratic system we have, the two parties, the electoral college, first past the post, voting, like, it's not the best system. But it's a lot better than what I just told you about they're trying to propose, which is basically elections in name only. Because, as I said, the only reason Trump failed in his efforts to overturn the election in 2020 is because there were civil servants in the government who stopped him. He is now trying to remove those people so he can, next time, overturn the election in his favor, even when. He loses. And so he's brought along many others on that right side of the aisle to implement his authoritarian ideals with him. Ones that fly in the face of the freedom they love to promote as Americans. They're the freedom loving party. Well, ultimately, what they're trying to implement in Project 2025, it's outlined, goes against freedom. It's literally the opposite. Like, it's not something we have to read between the lines on or just say, trust me, it's what they believe in. Trust me, guys, this is what Donald Trump's going to do. Just trust me, I know it. Like, you don't have to trust me. You just have to read that nonsense that uses carefully crafted language to make it seem legal and democratic, but in reality, it is anything of the sort. Like, one of Ronald Reagan's most famous quotes when he said in his inaugural address, 1981, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem, which is one that I vehemently disagree with because I believe government should actually be the ones helping everyone in this country live the American dream because libertarianism would fail dramatically if they ever got the chance. But even the modern Republican Party has moved away from Reagan and is now attempting to apply government power to fix problems that don't exist. Like, oh my gosh, we can't overturn elections in our favor. How terrible. Like, there are obviously many things about Trump and Project 2025 that are seriously troubling, which I outlined, but the threat it distinctively promotes towards democracy is the most troubling of all. And anyone who really truly believes in maintaining a representative democracy would reject the people advocating for that. I mean, listen, sometimes I understand one-issue voters, abortion, gun control, gun rights, whatever. But this, you could say, well, I'm against the Democrats on gun control or whatever, so I always vote Republican. And I'm still going to do that, even though they're promoting Project 2025. But they're literally trying to take away your right to do that. Like, a lot of it might have been hyperbole or nonsense or what you've heard previously from people who try to say the Republicans and Trump are going to try and take away your vote, your right to vote. But it's not hyperbole anymore. Like, it's actually written down. We don't have to say, just trust me, y'all. This is what they're going to do. They wrote it down. It's their plan. And they're not exactly... Be in secret about it either, which is why, yes, I'm going to say it for the next 13 months, the 2024 presidential election is the most important in your lifetime. And I know that gets said every four years, but this one truly is for that one reason alone. 
And so, you know, is it likely going to be implemented at all? That depends on the 2024 presidential election, because it is October 2023. We've got 13 months until the presidential election. But I host this podcast to inform, as I said at the beginning, and I truly believe this is something every single voter needs to know about before they make their vote next year. What one party, one candidate in this election are actually trying to do? And how I think to probably a lot of people, this one issue kind of trumps everything else. No pun intended. Like, you know, obviously we would hope that our democratic systems hold up against these threats like they did in 2020. But now the threats are being made towards these systems. Attempting to overturn the 2020 presidential election and the insurrection, those did not work. So now... Trump's team is attempting to change those systems so that he can do those things. Trump did a lot of damage in his four years as president, but the reason he didn't do more is because his team around him at the beginning was kind of incompetent. And by the end, he kind of realized that and kind of grew a more competent team, basically one that would say yes to all of his crazy requests. And another term of him as president would be that on steroids but also like could y'all imagine if he never decided to run for president i mean he probably would have gotten away with all the sexual assaults the fraud that he was just found liable for in court all the other sleazy things he's done in his life he probably would have gone off scot-free but his ego wouldn't let him and now he's in this historic predicament where he didn't just commit crimes before he was president he then committed crimes while he was president too And of course, we've covered the indictments on the podcast, by the way, if you want to go back and listen to those episodes we've done, outline those. Those are pretty good. But let's, oh my gosh, only if this was the biggest issue for the Republican Party right now. Like I just mentioned, Trump was found liable by a judge for fraud in New York and then complained that he didn't get a jury trial, just a trial with a judge. The reason he didn't get a jury trial is because his lawyers failed to check the box on a document saying he wanted a jury trial in this case. Like, the most simple of things. Whoops. He only hires the best, y'all. That's what he said. But there's also what's going on in the house right now, which I guess is a perfect way to end this chaotic podcast, because this is chaos. Kevin McCarthy, remember back in January, we did a whole podcast about this. We talked about the Voterama thing, 15 rounds. In the modern era, unprecedented. 15 rounds to elect a speaker. And finally, we get Kevin McCarthy, who we thought was going to be the Republican speaker in the end, because the Republicans only have about a five-seat majority in the House of Representatives. And now probably, if you go back and listen to that podcast in January, I'd probably say, you know, how long is Kevin McCarthy going to stay in the speakership? Probably not long, because of all the concessions that he made to get a deal with those far-right members of the Republican conference in the house to get them to vote for him because y'all remember was that whole thing late at night i feel like one member of the republican party lunged at another one there were words exchanged and we all got to see it because of the c-span cameras we're all you know looking around the house it was pretty cool but also i guess it wasn't at the same time well kevin mccarthy remained speaker until tuesday october 3rd Because he did the horrific thing of getting Democrats to vote on a deal to avert a government shutdown. Like I wrote about this on Xander's Weekend Facts. Sunday midnight was the deadline. And that bill got passed, signed by the president, like an hour before. It was the final day that first Kevin McCarthy made this deal with the far right members of the House to get, you know, all the spending cuts and all that stuff that they want in there. And it failed the House. He couldn't even get all the Republicans to vote for it. So ultimately, what he did was just pass the 45-day CR, a continuing resolution, which basically fully funds everything except for Ukraine funding, which I think is going to be in another bill. But that one, every Democrat, except for maybe one, voted for it. And a bunch of Republicans did not vote for it, but it passed because it got all the Democratic votes. But a man, Florida man, Congressman Matt Gates, did not like that. And he filed a motion to vacate 
the speakership. He did that on Monday, I believe, which he was allowed to do because remember, in January, one of the concessions that McCarthy made was that it took just one member of the majority party to file a motion to vacate the chair, when that is usually not the case. It usually takes a lot more to file a motion to remove the speaker. But it only takes one. And I'm surprised it took this long, because it only takes one vote. But Matt Gates finally filed that motion on Monday of this week, October 2nd. Now, that doesn't mean that McCarthy was automatically removed. It just means that a vote was triggered to remove him. And because on Tuesday, Gates grabbed enough Republicans, eight Republicans joined all the Democrats, and formed a majority. So for the first time ever in the history of the House of Representatives, a Speaker of the House was removed from the role by a vote of the House. It's a fact. Like just a week after the first impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden, into the first hearing for, I don't know, something something Hunter. Like the first witness, who's a Fox News contributor, Jonathan Turley, who went up there and said, well, you don't have the evidence right now or anything. And the Republicans have said they don't have the evidence, but they started this inquiry for, I don't know, giggles. So a week after he approved that, now he's out of his prize role. McCarthy even voted to go ahead with the baseless overturning of the results of the election after the insurrection had happened. And now he's not even speaker. And Joe Biden is still president. Oh, by the way, on Monday, McCarthy tweeted three words regarding the vote. Bring it on. <laughs> and uh, it's still up, by the way. Like, there's a Com there's a ratio where he has more comments than likes on it, which is pretty bad. Um, but he's, listen, bring it on. Well, they brought it on and he lost. And now we don't have a speaker. And McCarthy has said he is not running. So we're going to have a new speaker. Like, we don't even know if McCarthy's going to stay in Congress. He might just resign because he's still in Congress in his seat. But after that, I mean, do you want to stay? So we don't know who the next speaker is going to be. And now we're, I mean, we're basically in the same predicament we were as Jan in January, but the Republicans don't have a main candidate they've all coalesced around. Now, I, they'll probably find somebody who the far-right Republicans will vote for, because it seemed at that point like what Matt Gates and Kevin McCarthy had between them was kind of personal. So there may just be, you know, a Republican that they all vote for. but. You know, if not, then um, who knows what's going to happen. And apparently we're not going to get a vote for another week because everybody after Tuesday night is going home to their home districts. So it's going to take a while. And as I said, that was a 45 day continuing resolution. So in November, the government's going to shut down again unless the Senate and the House and the White House signs a government spending bill. So we'll see what happens. But it's important to remember that Republicans have a very slim majority, just five votes in the House. And so, you know, you can never rally that slim of a majority around anything, right? Right? Because, well, apparently you can, because Nancy Pelosi, if y'all remember, last term was Speaker. She had the same majority margin in the last Congress, and she didn't get removed. Nothing, she brought everything that came to the floor was passed by Democrats. And so what does that tell you? Democrats in array, Republicans in disarray, y'all. What a disaster. But you know what? Joe Biden is too old. We have to vote for the Republicans. I, even if they're trying to get rid of our democratic systems from the inside, y'all, I just worry too much about Hunter Biden's laptop. I can't vote for Joe Biden. Oh my gosh. Thankfully, we have 13 more months until the election, so we're going to have lots more politics to talk about on this podcast. But that is it for episode 119. Those are all the facts I have this week. Thank you all so much for listening, and remember that if you liked all the facts that we had on this week's edition of the podcast, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, rate and review the podcast, Check us out on all the socials, Twitter, threads, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Spread the facts. Tell all your friends. 
about the podcast, the newsletter, Xander's Facts on YouTube too. Go check out our YouTube channel because this episode is going to be posted with a nice background on YouTube. Subscribe, do all that, and check out the Xander's Facts link tree because it has all the Xander's Facts links that you need. So we're wrapping up episode 119. Hopefully next week or in the next two weeks, not sure. Episode 120 of this podcast is going to be coming out, but I can tell you that in the next few weeks, we are going to be talking about, it's October, the NBA starts in October, National Basketball Association, so of course we're going to have our NBA season preview, our Xander's Facts NBA analyst, Till Billy, hopefully has agreed to come back on the podcast this year to give us all of his NBA takes, he is, I'm sure he's feeling very emboldened with the trades that have just gone on for his bucks in the NBA, so that's coming up in a couple weeks, and of course in a month, we've got elections, now it's 2023, off year elections, but in Virginia, where I am, we've got some extremely important elections. So, of course, you know, later this month, beginning of November, we're going to have an elections preview for the off year elections, which obviously, you know, they might tell us something about what's going to happen next year, too. So, even if you don't live in Virginia or a couple of states that are electing their governor, Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, I think, even if you don't live in those states, they're still important. So we've got that preview coming up. We've got a bunch of facts coming up in the next few weeks here on the Xander's Facts podcast. But that is it. That is a wrap on episode 119 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. And we'll see y'all with episode 120 next week. Electrocution.